that doesn't mean we're out of the woods because now we come to the evidential problem of suffering which is still very much a live issue today. The atheistic claim here is that the suffering in the world renders it improbable that God exists. In particular, it seems highly improbable that God could have reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. So much of the suffering in the world seems to be pointless and unnecessary. Surely, God could have reduced the suffering in the world without reducing the world's overall goodness. So the suffering in the world provides evidence that there is no God. Now, this is a much more powerful version of the problem of evil. Since the conclusion is more modest, namely it's improbable that God exists, the atheist's burden of proof is much lighter. He doesn't shoulder so heavy a burden of proof in regard to the evidential problem. So what can we say in response to this version of the problem of evil? Well, I want to make three points. Number one, we're not in a position to say that it's improbable that God lacks good reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. The key to the evidential argument is the atheist claim that God doesn't have good reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. Now, I think we all recognize that much of the suffering in the world looks unjustified. We see neither its point nor its necessity. The success of the atheist's argument will depend on whether we're warranted in inferring that because the suffering looks unjustified, Therefore, it really is unjustified. That's the key move in the atheist argument. And my first point is that we're just not in a good position to assess that kind of probability with any confidence. You see, as finite persons, we are limited in intelligence and insight, in space and time. But God sees the end of history from the beginning, and he providentially orders history to arrive at his ends through people's free decisions and actions. And in order to arrive at his ultimate ends, God may well have to put up with a great deal of suffering along the way. Suffering, which appears pointless within our limited framework, might be seen to be justly permitted within God's wider framework. Let me give two illustrations of this point. First, one from contemporary science, and then one from popular culture. First illustration. In so-called chaos theory, scientists have discovered that certain large-scale systems, like weather systems or insect populations, are extraordinarily sensitive to the tiniest disturbances. A butterfly fluttering its wings on a twig in the jungles in West Africa can set in motion forces that eventuate in a hurricane over the Atlantic Ocean. And yet it is impossible in principle for anyone observing that little butterfly palpitating on that branch to be able to predict such an outcome. We simply have no way of knowing how the alteration of some seemingly insignificant little event can radically alter the world. Second illustration. The movie uh, Sliding Doors, starring Gwyneth Paltrow, tells the story of a young woman who is rushing down the stairs to catch the subway train. And as she nears the train, the movie splits into two paths that her life might take. In the one life, the doors to the train slide shut just before she can board the subway. In the other life, she manages to just get through the doors before they close. And based on this seemingly trivial event, the two paths of her lives increasingly diverge over time. In the one life, she's enormously successful, prosperous, and happy. 
In the other life, she encounters failure, misery, and unhappiness, and all because of a split-second difference in getting through the sliding doors of the subway train. Moreover, that difference depends upon whether a little girl playing with her dolly on the railing of the stairway is snatched away by her father or whether she momentarily blocks the young woman's path as she's rushing down to catch the train. And as you watch the movie, you can't help but wonder about what innumerable other trivialities led up to that event, whether the father and his daughter were delayed, perhaps leaving the house that morning because the little girl didn't like the breakfast cereal that her mother poured for her that day, or whether the man had been inattentive to his daughter that morning because his thoughts were preoccupied by something he read in the newspaper or because he had quarreled with his wife that morning. The uh, trivialities just begin to multiply until you can see that the ramifications of these become incalculable. But the most interesting part of the film is its ending. In the happy, successful life, the young woman is suddenly killed in an automobile accident. While in the other life, filled with misery and unhappiness, her life turns around and it turns out in the end that the life of hardship and suffering was the truly good life after all. Now, my point isn't that things always turn out for the best. No, what I'm saying is much more modest. What I'm saying is that given the dizzying complexity of life, we are simply in no position to judge that God has no sufficient reason for permitting some instance of suffering that enters our lives. Every event that occurs sends a ripple effect through history such that God's morally, morally sufficient reason for permitting it to happen might not emerge until centuries later, maybe in another country. Only an all-knowing God could grasp the complexities of directing a world of free people toward his previsioned goals. Just think, for example, of the innumerable, incalculable events involved in arriving at a single historical event, say the Allied victory at D-Day. We, we just have no idea of the suffering that might be involved in order for God to achieve some intended purpose through the freely chosen actions of human persons. Nor should we expect to discern God's reasons for permitting suffering, and therefore it's hardly surprising that much of the suffering in the world would appear pointless and unnecessary to us because we are simply overwhelmed by such complexity. Now this is not to appeal to mystery. I'm not just saying, oh, God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Rather, it is an appeal to our inherent cognitive limitations as finite persons, which make it impossible for us to say when confronted with some instance of suffering, that God probably has no good reason for permitting this to occur. Now, unbelievers recognize these limitations in other contexts. For example, one of the decisive objections to the ethical theory called utilitarianism, which says that you should seek the uh, action or the end which involves the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. One of the most important objections to utilitarianism is that we have no idea whatsoever of the ultimate outcome of our actions. Some short-term good might in the long run lead to untold misery, while some action that looks disastrous in the short run might turn out to be a great boon to humanity. We just don't have a clue as to what would bring about the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, and therefore this principle is useless in determining moral choices. So once you contemplate God's providence over the whole of human history, I think you can see how hopeless it is 
for finite limit observers to calculate or speculate about the probability of God's having a good reason for permitting the suffering that we observe. We're simply not in a position to assess that kind of probability with any sort of confidence.